Good morning, one and all. Thank you for attending today, this beautiful, cool morning, in my opinion. I'm chilly. <laughs> but thankfully, we have the warmth of God to heat us up. So let's praise our Lord this morning and just give him the praise that is due to him. Feel the wind on my back. 
sun rises, we get our hopes up. Hallelujah. When we see that sun waking up each morning, we can take that, those words to heart. We can have and remember reviving dreams. The wind on our back, that's a promise that God never fails and never gives up. When you're past the point of weary, we can always remember waking up each morning is a new day and a new revival. We praise you, Father God. to steer our own path in life. He 
and take the wrong path, he, he was always there to direct us back to the right path. He's always there to change our life, to lead us for the better path, the straight and narrow, not the long and winding road. We praise you, Father God, for a direct line to you through Jesus Christ. We praise you, Father God.
no shame. Every enemy has to flee in Jesus' name. Just the name of Jesus, darkness has to flee. The na simple name brings light into one's life. We praise you, Father God, that in that name of Jesus, the lost are saved. They find their way. Even when Christians, children of God, stray, we always find our way back because you never fail us. You never leave us. We give you praise and we glorify you, Father God. Let's sing Jesus again. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Let's sing His. Sing us to his name. Hallelujah. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. Jesus. If you're comfortable, let's lift up our hands. Thank God we can use his name. In his name, we lay hands on the sick. In his name, we come to the Father. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the name of Jesus, that name that's above every name. Thank you, Father, for your favor upon our lives. We thank you that you love us, we thank you that you're not only our creator, you're not only the one that has shaped us, but you are our heavenly father and you're for us. I thank you, Father, for opening doors of opportunity in each and every one of our lives that no man can shut. And I thank you, Father, that you've already made provision for every single area of our lives. And right now we just cast every care we cast every worry, every anxiety, every disappointment upon you because you care for us. You watch over us. You're the one that brings peace to us. You're the one that brings direction to us. I thank you for showing yourself strong on our behalf. I thank you, Father, for restoring joy. I thank you for restoring, Father, energy and strength 
and enthusiasm as we enjoy you, as we exchange heaviness for the, the garment of praise in the name of Jesus. And Father, we do speak the word over our leaders, anybody that's over us in authority. Father, we could talk about it. We could be upset with them. But Father, we believe that when we come to you in that mighty name, that your word's powerful. So we decree and we declare that our leaders are in your hand and that you're directing their steps and that you're working in their lives, that you're able to exalt the humble. You're able to, Father, bring down the proud. And I declare, Lord Jesus, that your will is being done. I decree, Father, that your goodness is being seen and that you have dominion from sea to shining sea in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that you have made provision not only for eternity, not only have you put away our sins, not only have you made a way where our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, but Father, you have made provision for every area of our lives. And so Father, I thank you that you have made provision for our health. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you sent your word and you healed us. And so, Father, we lift up anyone that is dealing with infirmity, with sickness, disease, with weakness, Father, with any kind of, dis, uh, any kind of disablement, any disability. And we declare, Father, by the stripes of Jesus, we're healed. And I thank you that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is quickening our mortal body, bringing life and healing to every nerve, every cell, every tissue, every part of our body. And we receive it right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, for those that are brokenhearted, those that are discouraged, those that are frustrated, I thank you, Father, that you are the glory and the lifter of our heads. Thank you, Father, for new beginnings. Thank you for a fresh start. Thank you, Father, that even though weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. New vision, new dreams, a new direction. I thank you, Father, that you cause us to rise up. And you're the one that pulls us out of the miry clay and sets our feet on the rock. You bring us to a wealthy place. You bring us to an enlarged place. I thank you, Father, that our best days and our most blessed days are not behind us, but they're right in front of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are showing forth your favor, that your light is becoming brighter and brighter against that day, and it's easier to make decisions than ever. That thank you for wisdom to make decisions that glorify you and honor you and bring us right into the fullness of our destiny. We thank you, Father, that 2022 will be our best year. It'll be our greatest year. It'll be the year of favor. It'll be a year of breakthroughs. It'll be a year, Father, where your word is fulfilled, where our desires are realized. Father, where are the promises that you have given to us, Father, that we're enjoying them. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that this is not a year of conflict. This is not a year of adverse weather. This is a year of great favor and great grace, great blessing, and we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, we welcome you to Faith Christian Fellowship, whether you're here in person or online, and we know God has something good in store because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I just want you to know that he is the one that even counts the very hairs on our head. He knows everything about us. He knows our going in. He knows our, our going out. He knows everything about us. And yet he is showing himself strong in our behalf. And we can be very thankful that he is our partner. He's our companion. And he has good things in store. And only his goodness and mercy follow us. He's good. He's good all the time. And he, his goodness will be seen in our lives. Thank God. Uh, you can be seated in his name. We celebrated Father's Day last week. We're not going to do it this week, but I'll just <laughs> refer 
refer back to it, refers to earthly fathers and also our heavenly father. And I'm going to read something that uh, John G. Lake said. There is a thing that is dearer to God than anything else and the only thing that is worthwhile. It is the same thing that is dearer to every man. That thing is the affection of your heart. You can see your son rise to a place of eminence and respect in the world, yet he will disappoint your soul. Why? Because the soul of the real father is seeking something besides that. He is seeking the affection of the son, and if he fails to receive it, all the rest is barren. Christ is seeking the affection of mankind, the union of their spirit with his, for without their affection, there can never be that deep union of the spirit between God and man, God and man that makes possible a richness of life made glorious by his indwelling. That is why the love of God is held forth in the word as the one supreme attraction to draw the soul of man in returned affection. And you can give your Lord, give to your Lord your money and your property and your brain and all the other things that are usually considered to be very excellent. But if you withhold your affections from him and give them to another, the word says you are an adulterer. So a great example is David in the Psalms. Between him and the Lord, there was affection there. There was feelings there. There was a love um, that could not be shaken. And David poured out his heart to the Lord, and the Lord would pour out his heart to David, and there was a communion there. And the same thing with the disciple that Jesus loved, John. There's such an affection there. So sometimes we can do all our confessions, we can read the word, we can have our devotions, but where's our heart concerning the Lord? Do we have his passion? Do we have his heart? Is he really close to us? Or is it just a form? Or is it just religion? We can easily slip away from that affection for the Lord. So I would encourage you, step up your seeking of the Lord, draw near to him, and he'll draw near to us. And... You know, we don't want to d deal with the Lord just at arm's length, so to speak, and just, you know, religiously do things. We want to really be in love with the Lord. And um, so that's awesome. Just like fathers like to be in love with their sons and sons with fathers and parents with children, same way God desires that from us. And our heart isn't satisfied unless we are also that way with him. So that's awesome. Let's put up the confession. And even when we do this confession, um, we can sometimes say all the wor words, but let's put our heart in it, our heart toward the Lord who gave us all these things. He is the giver of every good gift. Let's say it together. I am blessed, redeemed, forgiven, loved, healed, free, prosperous, talented, creative, confident, secure, disciplined, focused, prepared, qualified, determined, equipped, empowered, motivated, valuable, anointed, accepted, and approved, not average, not mediocre. I am a child of the Most High God. I will become all that I was created to be. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vern. I just want to share a couple jokes. If you see me talking to myself, keep walking. I'm self-employed, and I'm having a staff meeting. <laughs> Jesus can walk on water, and I can walk on cucumbers. Cucumbers are 96% water, therefore I'm 96% like Jesus. <laughs> I wish mosquitoes sucked fat rather than blood. <laughs> uh, let's stand.
Let's make our confession. Let's release our faith. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. Never the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated in His name. I want to talk to you today about getting through what you're going through. Last week we talked about understanding that God is our Father. He's not just our Creator. He's our Father. And He loves us. And He cares for us. And He has us right in the palm of His hand. And people wonder, well, if God is so good, why is life so bad? Well, we need to know that life, the way we see it today, was not God's original plan. Before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they, this earth was different. Life was different. There was no such thing as death in the garden. Uh, you know, we've been under two water, boil water advisories in the last, what is it, six weeks, two months? In the Garden of Eden, there were no boil water advisories. The water was pure. And we know that there was no disease there. There was no divorce there. There was no discouragement there. There was no frustration there. There was no frostbite there. There was nothing that steals, kills, and destroys in the garden. But because Adam and Eve doubted the integrity of God's word. In other words, they doubted that what God said he didn't mean that man fell, Adam fell. Sin, sickness, disease, uh, dis discouragement, violence, hatred, despondency entered into the world there were this was never part of God's plan God's plan was always that earth be exactly a replica of heaven that's what the Garden of Eden was but because of Adam things are different and it's because of the fall of Adam there's pain in the world because of the fall of Adam there's suffering there's hunger there's violence there's drive-by shootings there's all kinds of disorder. Uh, wor the world is broken. You know, the weather patterns are different than they were in God's original plan. I, I believe it was last week in Afghanistan, there was an earthquake. And thousands of people were killed. And uh, last year was a drought. And the farmers could barely harvest their crop. And I think everybody was saying, we'll never complain about rain again. <laughs> and then this year, we'll never complain about warm weather again. It's raining too much. See, it wasn't that way in the beginning. God's, God's original dream. It's because of the fall that we endure these things. No one died. There was no death in, in God's original plan. Things have changed. Because of Adam's fall, that's why we struggle our, keep our body healthy. That's why we're, we deal with many of the things that we're, we're dealing with in life. That's why our marriages and our relationships and our friendships don't work perfectly all the time. It's because of the fall of Adam. So God gets blamed for so much that's going on and I want you to know he's good. God is not the author of all the things that people are upset with him about. You know when something goes wrong who do people curse? It's God. But God is the good 
is a good God. When we look at God's will being done in its fullness, we look at the garden, we look at the millennial reign, a thousand years of reign when the enemy is not in uh, active. It says during the millennial reign that a child will play with a rattlesnake safely. That a lion and a lamb will lie down together. You wouldn't want to do that today. Do you know why they have signs at, at the zoo? Don't take a selfie with a lion. People try it. And then they wonder, oh my goodness, I got all chewed up. Or you go to the national park and they say, don't feed the bears and the wild animals. Why? Don't try ride a moose and then take a picture of yourself. Why do they do it? Because we're in a fallen world. It's broken. There's a day coming when Jesus is going to come back and he's going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and the books are going to be opened and everything's going to change. And we won't have to worry about pollution. We won't have to worry about uh, the water. We're not going to have to worry about anything. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And life is going to be the way God originally intended because he's in charge. But God could fix everything right now. He could stop all the violence in the world, all the hatred in the world, all the hunger in the world, just by taking away our free will. God can make everybody on the face of this, this earth to love him, to serve him, to pray day and night, and to honor him, and to do the right thing, never overeat, never overspend, Never be angry, never be frustrated, never exaggerate, never lie, never gossip. He could make us do the right thing all the time, and he could make everybody do that, but God wouldn't want that because he's not into having robots. He's given us a free will. This is why we have the mess we have is because we only serve God to the degree that we love Him. God wants people that love Him from their own heart, not because they have to, not because they're forced to, not because somebody's made them to. God wants our affection, as Vern was talking about. He wants our love, and He wants us to get a revelation of how much He loves us so that we can reciprocate that love and love him back. That's the risk he's taken. So no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what you're going through, I want you to know that God is good. He's not the problem. He's not the one that is bringing things that steal, kill, and destroy. He is the one that we run to in our time of trouble. He is the, he's our answer. And we need to know that in no matter what we're going through, we're never alone. I'll put it this way. We don't have to do life alone. We, we can do life knowing that God is good and that we can come to him at any time concerning anything, whether it is something big, whether it is something small, whether it's a spiritual issue, whether it is a, an emotional issue, whether it is a relational issue, that we can come to God at any time, and He's not going to condemn us. He's not going to bully us. He's not going to shame us. He's not going to be disgusted with us. He has an open invitation for us to come to us because He loves us. And he wants to help us. And he wants to restore us. And he wants to be there for us. Because that's the kind of God he is. So God is good. But he wants us to come. Just as we are. And he doesn't want us just to come to him as we are for salvation. Many times we know that we, just as I am. I come with, without one plea. You know, we, we come to him, whether we are broke, busted, disgusted, no matter what's going on, we can come to him. doesn't matter what we're wearing. doesn't matter how we've been living. We come as we are, and he takes us as we are. 
but sometimes after we become Christians, we somehow we got in our mind that we can't come to him and receive grace at any time, but we can. Doesn't matter who we are, we can come to him. Let's look at Hebrews 4, 16. It says, so let us come boldly to his throne. Let's come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it the most. I believe it's the old King James says, come boldly to the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help. And again, when we need it the most, he, it's an open invitation. That means God has already come to us and we have an open invitation to come to him at any time concerning anything. If it's something that's on our heart, he wants us to bring it to him. Now he knows what's going on. He knows what's going on in our life. So when we tell him what's happening, it's not the first time he knows about it. He knows it all. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're talking about. He, he knows even the very intents of our heart all the time. But he invites us to come to him at any time. I remember Lynn Hammond sharing this story. And of course, uh, Lynn and her husband, Mac, pastor a mega church in Minneapolis. And a girl came into her office wanting help and so Lynn let her share her story and I don't remember all that this girl was into but after she shared her story Lynn just broke down and sobbed and said I cannot help you I wouldn't even know where to start but I know God can help you she said Let's get down on our knees, the both of us, and let's come to the throne of grace together. And let's ask God to help us. And the girl said, well, what do I say? Now listen to this. Lynn told her, you tell God exactly what you told me. And tell it the way you told me. And because she didn't have any religious training, she never balked at that. Because she didn't have any religious training, she kept her Kleenex box out and, and, and cried and gave her, gave her story to Jesus just the same way she shared it to Lynn. Do you know that that young lady went on? She, she obtained mercy. She got help in her time of need. I'm not saying it happened in, in the twinkling of an eye. But that was the beginning of it. And she, her and her husband were involved in the children's ministry in that mega church for many years. A great blessing to the church after, after that. And uh, the last I heard of them, the, this, this lady and her husband are, are pastoring a church in the southern states. I want you to know that it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what we're going through. God loves us. He has a plan for us, and he wants us to come to him. And he doesn't want us to come with pretense. To see the Pharisees, they, all, they went around, and everything was a facade. But Jesus, he, he came different. He had a relationship. And he came, and he talked to God just like he was his father. I was reading the, the book of Nehemiah the other day, and when he heard that the walls of the city of Jerusalem had been broken and burnt in, and were in rubble and that the gates had been destroyed. The city gates had been destroyed. The Bible says he sat down. He was in such shock. He sat down. He wept. And he fasted and he prayed for many days. Isn't that something? When... When we come into a situation like that, that our first response is just to come into God's presence. Because Nehemiah knew 
that if he's going to help the people in Jerusalem, he's got to get that stuff out of his spirit. The parable of the sower says, well, we'll go back to Proverbs 4. It says, above everything else you do in life, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of your heart flows everything in life. And so, um, and the parable of the sower says, that these things, the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, and all the anxiety, all the worry, all the concern, they choke the word from producing in our lives. And so that's why we have to come to God and get this stuff out. And we have to allow God to deal with it so that we're in a position so that when we speak to our mountain, it moves. And things happen in our life. There's a story in the Old Testament about a woman by the name of Hannah who could not have a baby. And she was so broken hearted that 1 Samuel 1 says that she would weep constantly and she had trouble even eating. Now that, that's a tough spot because bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness they affect every area of your life. Many people have fallen short of their destiny because of these things. They've got offended, they're bitter, they're angry, they're upset with people, they're mad at God, and they miss the good things that God has in store. You know, the people that go to a school, public school, and start shooting teachers and, and children. That wasn't a result of them just having a bad day. There had been something smoldering for a long time. They had been hurt. They had been disappointed. They had been frustrated a long time ago. Maybe mom and dad got divorced. Or maybe some authority figure abused them or some unfair thing happened to them and they didn't know what to do with it so they buried it do you know that the things that we bury have a high resurrection rate that's why somebody that is beside us at the at the lights maybe Maybe there, there's something going on in their life. They just turn around and they take a gun and they, they, they take a shot at somebody. That wasn't just because a person didn't take off quick enough. There was something going on long before that. God wants us to come to him with these things. Yes, we need to express these things. And yes, there's medication. And I believe there's some people, I'll tell you, please don't go off the medication. Because some people are a hazard when they're not on their medication. But I'm telling you, there is somebody that can heal our heart. Somebody can heal our achy, breaky heart. And that is God. But he can't do it until we come to him. We must come to him. And this is what Hannah did. This is the key to her victory. In her sadness. In her despondency. Now, this isn't a place where she's using her dominion. This isn't a place where she's gaining ground for the kingdom of God. But this is a place that if she's going to gain uh, gr ground for the kingdom of God, if she's going to make a difference in her generation, first of all, she, uh, God is a God of the heart. And she has to get healed from the inside out. You know... Only up people can help down people up. Down people cannot help down people up. In her sadness, she came to the temple to pray. That was the breakthrough. That was the beginning. She came to pray. And after the, the priest, and she, she came to pray, and she wasn't leaving until she got a breakthrough. And when Eli the priest went to, uh, you know, shut the lights off and lock everything up after everybody had left, he stumbled across her. And she was still praying. 
Why? Because she was desperate to get what was that bitterness out. To get that sadness out. Thank God she prayed. God wants us to always bring not just our praises to him, not just our dreams to him, but our pain to him, our, our frustration to him. He wants us to come to him like we would come to somebody else. He wants us to unload on him. He would rather we unload on him than our neighbor. He will listen to us without judgment and he will heal us. And he will help us. You know, Hannah had been talking to her husband about that and he was very kind. He was very non-judgmental. It was a safe place to go to him, but he was limited. But when we come to the throne of grace, we're coming to the unlimited one. He's the one that can really change us from the inside out. Let's look at 1 Samuel 1, verse 10. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. The margin in one of my Bibles says that she was in the deepest of grief. 1 Samuel 1.10. That's how she came to him. That's where a lot of people despair of life. That's where a lot of people give up on their dreams. That's where a lot of people get upset with God. Why does God allow it? And again, I want you to know, God isn't the, to blame for what's going on in this world. God's our answer. God wants us to tell him everything that's going on in our mind because he knows what's going on anyway. But you see, just because he knows what's going on in our life, that doesn't mean he's going to intrude and fix it for us. We have not because we ask that we still have to come to him. And a lot of times we don't come to him because we don't understand that God is accessible and he's all powerful. He, the Bible says he'll perfect those things which concern you. What's that mean? That means if it's something that's important to you, it's important to him. Because he's your partner. And if it's something on your heart, he wants it to be on his heart. If it's something that you're dealing with, he wants to deal with it. See, that's what was happening in the garden before the fall. Everything God did, Adam was a part of it. Was right in the middle of it. Everything that Adam did, God was right in the middle of it. That was God's original dream. That's what he wants for us today. He wants to be involved. Not just on the good times, he wants to be involved in every aspect of our lives and he wants us involved in everything he's doing on the earth today. And it's all on an invitation basis. God's not going to make us do anything. And Eli thought she was drunk because she was laying there and her lips were moving but there was no sound coming out of her mouth. And he rebuked her and he gave her a little kick probably and said, what are you doing? You've been drinking. She said, I have not been drinking. Do we have verse 16? No, we don't. Uh, oh, we do. 15. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I've been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. She was not a wicked woman. Just because bad things happen to you doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people, you take mom and dad divorce, a lot of times the kids take the shame and the blame, and they blame themselves. And that's why a lot of times they're messed up, because, but it was no, nothing that they had done. Or something has happened. A lot of times people, they, something bad happened to you, well, I probably deserved it. No, that's not true. She said, I am not a wicked person. I have not been drinking. But one thing about people that drink, they don't have any trouble talking. That's why you take a lot of 
office Christmas parties, they've stopped using liquor now because somebody was at the last one and had too much and got talking about the boss and his wife. And he has no idea what he said, but the boss and his wife heard it. They talked about it at home, privately, but when they got uh, lit up, they talked very freely. And they just they, they just let it all out, and and they don't know what else they said. And they got fired. Well, we need to know that with God, He wants us to come and talk to Him freely. He's not going to fire us. He's not going to reject us. He's He's going to give us mercy, and He's going to give us grace, and He's going to pull us out of that miry pit. Then. We can get the promises of God in our heart and on our lips and get results. King David said in Psalm 62, 8, Trust Him at all times. Pour out your heart to Him, for He is our refuge. James 5 and 16 says that the heartfelt, continued, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. In other words, when Hannah went to before the Lord, she didn't go with a, a written prayer. She didn't go with a recited prayer. She didn't go into the temple that day, God is good, God is great, or... Now, Lord, lay me down to sleep. You know, it was nothing, you know, sometimes we got these prayers, we just push a button, we do it automatically without even thinking. This was not a recited prayer. When we are going to get help from God, it must come out of our heart. Because out of our heart, Jesus said, flow the issues of life, flow the, the important things of life. What is placed inside is what comes out. And she was freely sharing with him what was going on. And it wasn't long after coming boldly to the throne of grace in her time of despair, in her time of despondency, in her time of sadness, that she conceived and had a baby boy, and they named the baby Samuel. Psalm 35 says, Weeping may endure for a night. Do you know the rest of it? But joy comes in the morning. No matter what difficult season you're going through, no matter what is happening, the, what roadblock that you're facing, no matter what discouragement or distress that you're having to, to press through, I want you to know that this season will not last forever. That there is joy coming. There is breakthroughs coming. There is change coming. It's only a season. Joy is going to come. Better days are ahead. Yes, weeping is for a night. But joy comes in the morning. And as you walk with God, He'll heal your heart. And He'll lead you into new seasons of joy. And you will experience a freshness. You will experience a, a, a new enthusiasm beyond anything that you have ever experienced in your life. You're going to cry out until you break out. When you pray, be aware that you have the ear of your Heavenly Father and He will answer your prayer. When you're going through what you're going through, God will listen to you. See, He doesn't just want our spirit free from offense and jealousy and hatred and, and discouragement. And frustration but he has made a way where he can download his goodness his mercy his strength his direction new assignments new dreams new territory new ground to take Hannah like every great person was able to rise above her pain and the hurts of the past to step into her destiny. God's no respecter of persons, but we must come to Him. 
like Hannah, no matter what you've experienced. With God's help and enablement, you can be energized to break through what you're going through and come through victoriously. We often don't go to God with everything because we don't believe that He cares and we don't believe that He's going to help us. You know, years ago, a TV evangelist lost his daughter and son-in-law in a plane accident. And on national television, he said that he was mad at God and that he forgave God. You know, all the religious people were mad that he had talked to God that way. But God was cool with it. God didn't have a problem with it. Because God knew before he said that, that's exactly what he was feeling and thinking. So he just let God, he, rather than keep it, you know, God wasn't the problem. God didn't take his daughter. But he was feeling upset with God, and he told God all about it, and he forgave God. And you know, God could handle that. Not a problem. God knew that this grieving father was brokenhearted long before he mentioned it. And like Hannah, he simply poured out his soul and that spirit of grief was broken over his life. And he was able to step up and step on and move in to the next phase of his life. You know, most of the psalms, most of the songs, uh, most of the, the um, hymns that, that really minister to us came out of seasons of great trial and difficulty rather than a jam session. You know, some of the songs that, that come forth when people are just sitting around and jamming, they're so exciting for about two weeks and three weeks, and, and the beat is good and everything's good. But uh, six months from now, you know, we can't think about it. We hardly rec we can hardly remember anything about them. But there's some of these hymns and some of these songs that that came like you t that came uh, out of a time of great trial, and somebody poured out their heart to God, and then God downloaded His heart into them, and it 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 brings an anointing to it. Think of the hymn, It's Well With My Soul. This uh, hymn of hope, mercy, and grace by Horatio Spafford was given to this grieving father when God downloaded mercy and grace into his spirit after he lost his daughters at sea. And many times when people sing it, there's an anointing there, and, and it breaks bands. And, and many songs are like that. Why do we feel so alone if God loves us so much? Because many times we just don't come to Him in our time of trouble. And as Vern was talking about before, about David, that was one thing with David. Now David was the kind of guy you didn't want hanging around your house if he wasn't praying. Look what he did to his friend Uriah. When he wasn't praying, he was just, you, you couldn't trust him anymore than you could trust anybody else. When he was praying, he was good. But here's what I want you to know. When we feel so alone, we, we can come to God. And he's always there for us. He's never in a bad mood. He's never upset with us. He's never stressed out. He's never an emotional basket case. He's never too busy for us. He's never, he never, we're never on hold. How many have tried to phone a credit card company or tried to phone a, a phone company and, and tried to get some answers? <laughs> and you, you think, oh my goodness, when can I phone? Like, what, what's this helpline all about? Your wait time is nine hours. 
I, I want you to know with God, you, the wait time is never nine hours. Instant. Instant. Even though there's eight, almost eight billion of us, he will, he'll listen to us all at the same time, and he gives us individual attention as if we're the only one talking to him. And we can come to him. See, when somebody lies to us, when somebody betrays us, when somebody's mean to us, when somebody tries to steal our customers, when somebody tries to destroy us and ruin our credibility, when we're, when we're in these situations or we've lost a loved one or, or, or lost our health or lost a business, We often tell, call a friend and tell him everything that's going on and how unfair it is and you can't believe what they did or she did or he did and, and, and we let them know every little detail. Why don't we do that with God? Well, because we're not sure. We're not sure he can handle it. I want you to know that God can handle it and not only can he handle it, he can help us. And he can lift us. Uh, I think of David. Psalm 64, 1. And this isn't just this psalm, but many psalms. Many times David would be so mad at his enemies, he'd tell God, just get them. Now that's not really new covenant praying. But that is really what he was thinking. God knew that was what he was thinking. So look, look at 64.1 is just one of them. I won't read it all. A Psalm of David. Oh God, listen to my complaint. That's what he, he said. Perfect, protect my life from the enemy's threats. Hide me from the plots of this evil mob. From this gang of wrongdoers. They sharpen their tongues like swords. And they aim their bitter words like arrows. They shoot from ambush at the innocent, attacking suddenly and fearlessly. And he goes on and on and on, and I like when it comes to verse 7. But God himself will shoot them with his arrows, suddenly striking them down. B but here's, here's my point, is when David felt like he was surrounded, felt like a victim, felt like everybody and everything was coming against him, he just said, God, this is what's going on. But after a while, he recognized, hey, if God's for us, what difference does it make who or what is against us? He could come into that place of dominion, that place of faith. But he had to come to God first and get that out of his spirit, get that off his mind. That's how God brought David from trauma to triumph. You know, I knew a, a farmer once. He was telling us that it was not wet. The weather wasn't wet like it is here. Now, it was really dry like last year. And his field was blowing. And he was so worried. He was so discouraged. He felt so helpless. There wasn't anything he could do to fix it. And there wasn't anyone who could help him. So he took to the Psalms, and he walked the fields just reading the Psalms. Why? Because a lot of these Psalms, David came to the Lord in his time of distress. And as he would read those Psalms, there was an anointing there, and it would strengthen him. And it didn't really change the situation, but it changed his focus. And God brought him through. I mean, he's probably still farming. But that that sense of despondency, that sense of hopelessness was destroying him, was robbing him of joy, blinding him to his destiny and to the goodness of God in his life. I think of Linda's dad. I don't know how long he was blind, legally blind. I'm sure it was over 30 some years. And when he first got blind, his wife had to almost do everything for him. Lead him like a little child and, and just, just serve him day and night. But then she died. 
and he moved to town here, went to an apartment, and do you think he'd take home care? He made his own meals, dressed himself. took care of himself, but he trusted God for everything. When he couldn't find something, he would ask God to show him where it was. When he couldn't remember a phone number, he would ask God to bring to his remembrance the phone number. And, and for many years, before he got any home care at all, he lived in that apartment by himself, but he wasn't by himself. He had learned to talk to God day and night. You know, it reminds you of that scripture in First Thessalonians five sixteen that we are to rejoice without ceasing, we're to pray without ceasing. You're thinking, how can you do it? Well he did. It's like one person said, one somebody asked one person, How much how long do you pray a day? Well I, I called God up and I never hung up. Mr. Shemta, he had to depend. The line was open all the time. He talked to God about anything and everything because he had to. Because we couldn't be there all the time. But God could. And God helped him. And, and that's, that was a legacy he left. And so I just want to encourage you. You can call out till things break out. You can go from trauma to, tri uh, to triumph. God's no respecter of persons. What he did for one, he'll do for anyone. And when we come to him, he's not going to say, not you again. No, when we come to him, he's looking for us. Here's what I want you to know today. You can take comfort knowing that your heavenly father has his arms wide open and he's waiting to receive you. And he knows what you're presently going through and he has a way out. And when you can hardly put one foot in front of another, he wants to strengthen you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to help you. He's a loving, heavenly father, and he wants to shape your life regardless of what you're going through. And what God has planned can't be stopped by people, can't be stopped by the weather, can't be stopped by the government, can't be stopped by your mistakes. can't be stopped by bad breaks or by any loss you've gone through. If you'll just keep coming to him, God will get you to where you need to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you that you are a loving Heavenly Father. And you have given us unlimited access to your mercy and to your grace. You're slow to anger and your tender mercies and compassion are over all of your works. We honor you today. And we thank you. That there's nothing too hard for you. There's nothing too difficult for you. that you're a very present help in our time of trouble. And you've made a way where we can come to you at any time concerning anything, not just to unload, but so that you can download new vision, new dreams, new strength, new hope, new assignments for greater days and better days. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you're here today or watching online, and you're very down. I want you to know God is never the problem. He's not the one that is against us. One thing that you and I need to be established in is that God's on your side. He's for you. After all, He created you. He only has good things in store for you. His plans for you are for good and not for evil to give you a hope and an expected end. And even though other people 
are blaming him for what's happened in the world. You realize today, God's not the author of destruction. He's not the one that steals, kills, and destroys. He's not the one that robs us of anything. He's the, he's, the, he's the giver of joy. He's the giver of life. And you realize that you've been mad at the wrong person. And I just want you just to, just to release that all to him today. Just, just tell him, Lord, I'm, I, I recognize I was mad at the wrong person. You're my answer. Christ is the answer. The anointing is the answer. The love of God's the answer. And that you can come to him and he'll take you right where you are and he'll get you to where you need to be. So if you've never come to him or like so many people, many people today, one time love God, one time serve God, something happened. Life happens to all of us. Something happened and God have stopped praying. Stop talking to God. Stop talking to the people of God. It's a time for a comeback. God's the author of, of comebacks. You can come back to him because you realize he was never the problem in the first place. But you can be restored today. All you do is just come into his presence and you can come just as you are, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a non-Christian. Just say this. Jesus, we'll all say it together. Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. You're my answer, never my problem. I come to you today in faith. I believe with my heart that God raised you from the dead for my salvation, for my healing, for my freedom, for my restoration, for my wholeness, so that I may have peace that passes all understanding. Fill me with your spirit. Give me a revelation of your love so that I can serve you all the days of my life and serve you with gladness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you're watching online, uh, we have information we'd like to send you. Just use the address and the information on the screen. If you're here in person, we have information we'd like to give you. I want you to know God's good. I want you to know you can come to Him at any time over anything. Now may the Lord keep you and bless you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. May the blessings of Abraham chase you down. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Trust you'll experience the goodness of God this week. Even if bad things happen, God is still good. Amen. God bless.